Section 7 of Selections from the Principles of Philosophy by René Descartes. Translated by John Veitch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Principles of Material Things. 14. Wherein place and space differ. The terms place and space, however, differ in signification, because place more expressly designates situation than magnitude or figure, while, on the other hand, we think of the latter when we speak of space for we frequently say that a thing succeeds to the place of another although it be not exactly of the same magnitude or figure but we do not therefore admit that it occupies the same space as the other and when the situation is changed we say that the place is also changed although there are the same magnitude and figure as before so that when we say that a thing is in a particular place we mean merely that it is situated in a determinate way in respect of certain other objects and when we add that it occupies such a space or place we understand besides that it is of such determinate magnitude and figure as exactly to fill this space fifteen how external place is rightly taken for the superficies of the surrounding body and thus we never indeed distinguish space from extension in length breadth and depth we sometimes however consider place as in the thing placed and at other times as out of it internal place indeed differs in no way from space but external place may be taken for the superficies that immediately surrounds the thing placed it ought to be remarked that by superficies we do not here understand any part of the surrounding body but only the boundary between the surrounding and surrounded bodies which is nothing more than a mode or at least that we speak of superficies in general which is no part of one body rather than another but is always considered the same provided it retain the same magnitude and figure for although the whole surrounding body with its superficies were changed it would not be supposed that the body which was surrounded by it had therefore changed its place if it meanwhile preserved the same situation with respect to the other bodies that are regarded as immovable thus if we suppose that a boat is carried in one direction by the current of a stream and impelled by the wind in the opposite with an equal force so that its situation with respect to the banks is not changed we will readily admit that it remains in the same place although the whole superficies which surrounds it is incessantly changing sixteen that a vacuum or space in which there is absolutely no body is repugnant to reason with regard to a vacuum in the philosophical sense of the term that is a space in which there is no substance it is evident that such does not exist seeing the extension of space or internal place is not different from that of body for since from this alone that a body has extension in length breadth and depth we have reason to conclude that it is a substance it being absolutely contradictory that nothing should possess extension we ought to form a similar inference regarding the space which is supposed void that is that since there is extension in it there is necessarily also substance seventeen that a vacuum in the ordinary use of the term does not exclude all body and in truth by the term vacuum in its common use we do not mean a place or space in which there is absolutely nothing but only a place in which there is none of those things we presume ought to be there thus because a pitcher is made to hold water it is said to be empty when it is merely filled with air or if there are no fish in a fish pond we say there is nothing in it although it be full of water thus a vessel is said to be empty when in place of the merchandise which it was designed to carry it is loaded with sand only to enable it to resist the violence of the wind and finally it is in the same sense that we say space is void when it contains nothing sensible although it contain created and self-subsisting matter for we are not in the habit of considering the bodies near us unless in so far as they cause in our organs of sense impressions strong enough to enable us to perceive them and if in place of keeping in mind what ought to be understood by these terms a vacuum and nothing we afterwards suppose that in the space we call the vacuum there is not only no sensible object but no object at all we will fall into the same error as if because a pitcher in which there is nothing but air is in common speech said to be empty we were therefore to judge that the air contained in it is not a substance res subsistence eighteen how the prejudice of an absolute vacuum is to be corrected we have almost all fallen into this error from the earliest age for observing that there is no necessary connection between a vessel and the body it contains we thought that god at least could take from a vessel the body which occupied it without it being necessary that any other should be put in the place of the one removed 
but that we may be able now to correct this false opinion it is necessary to remark that there is in truth no connection between the vessel and the particular body which it contains but that there is an absolutely necessary connection between the concave figure of the vessel and the extension considered generally which must be comprised in this cavity so that it is not more contradictory to conceive a mountain without a valley than such a cavity without the extension it contains or this extension apart from an extended substance for as we have often said of nothing there can be no extension and accordingly if it be asked what would happen were god to remove from a vessel all the body contained in it without permitting another body to occupy its place the answer must be that the sides of the vessel would thus come into proximity with each other for two bodies must touch each other when there is nothing between them and it is manifestly contradictory for two bodies to be apart in other words that there should be a distance between them and this distance yet be nothing for all distance is a mode of extension and cannot therefore exist without an extended substance nineteen that this confirms what was said of rarefaction after we have thus remarked that the nature of corporeal substance consists only in its being an extended thing and that its extension is not different from that which we attribute to space however empty it is easy to discover the impossibility of any one of its parts in any way whatsoever occupying more space at one time than at another and thus of being otherwise rarefied than in the way explained above and it is easy to perceive also that there cannot be more matter or body in a vessel when it is filled with lead or gold or any other body however heavy and hard than when it but contains air and is supposed to be empty for the quantity of the parts of which a body is composed does not depend on their weight or hardness but only on the extension which is always equal in the same vase twenty that from this the non-existence of atoms may likewise be demonstrated we likewise discover that there cannot exist any atoms or parts of matter that are of their own nature indivisible for however small we suppose these parts to be yet because they are necessarily extended we are always able in thought to divide any one of them into two or more smaller parts and may accordingly admit their divisibility for there is nothing we can divide in thought which we do not thereby recognize to be divisible and therefore were we to judge it indivisible our judgment would not be in harmony with the knowledge we have of the thing and although we should even suppose that god had produced any particle of matter to a smallness so extreme that it did not admit of being further divided it would nevertheless be improperly styled indivisible for though god had rendered the particle so small that it was not in the power of any creature to divide it he could not however deprive himself of the ability to do so since it is absolutely impossible for him to lessen his own omnipotence as was before observed wherefore absolutely speaking the smallest extended particle is always divisible since it is such of its very nature twenty one it is thus also demonstrated that the extension of the world is indefinite we further discover that this world or the whole universitas of corporeal substance is extended without limit for wherever we fix a limit we still not only imagine beyond it spaces indefinitely extended but perceive these to be truly imaginable in other words to be in reality such as we imagine them so that they contain in them corporeal substance indefinitely extended for as has already been shown at length the idea of extension which we conceive in any space whatever is plainly identical with the idea of corporeal substance twenty two it also follows that the matter of the heavens and earth is the same and that there cannot be a plurality of worlds and it may also be easily affirmed from all this that the earth and heavens are made of the same matter and that even although there were an infinity of worlds they would all be composed of this matter from which it follows that a plurality of worlds is impossible because we clearly conceive that the matter whose nature consists only in its being an extended substance already wholly occupies all the imaginable spaces where these other worlds could alone be and we cannot find in ourselves the idea of any other matter twenty three that all the variety of matter or the diversity of its forms depends on motion there is therefore but one kind of matter in the whole universe and this we know only by its being extended all the properties we distinctly perceive to belong to it are reducible to its capacity of being divided and moved according to its parts and accordingly it is capable of all those affections which we perceive can arise from the motion of its parts for the partition of matter in thought makes no change in it but all variation of it or diversity of form depends on motion 
the philosophers even seem universally to have observed this for they said that nature was the principle of motion and rest and by nature they understood that by which all corporeal things become such as they are found in experience twenty four what motion is taking the term in its common use but motion that is local for i can conceive no other kind of motion and therefore i do not think we ought to suppose there is any other in nature in the ordinary sense of the term is nothing more than the action by which a body passes from one place to another and just as we have remarked above that the same thing may be said to change and not to change place at the same time so also we may say that the same thing is at the same time moved and not moved thus for example a person seated in a vessel which is setting sail thinks he is in motion if he looks to the shore that he has left and consider it as fixed but not if he regard the ship itself among the parts of which he preserves always the same situation moreover because we are accustomed to suppose that there is no motion without action and that in rest there is the cessation of action the person thus seated is more properly said to be at rest than in motion seeing he is not conscious of being in action twenty five what motion is properly so called but if instead of occupying ourselves with that which has no foundation unless in ordinary usage we desire to know what ought to be understood by motion according to the truth of the thing we may say in order to give it a determinate nature that it is the transporting of one part of matter or of one body from the vicinity of those bodies that are in immediate contact with it or which we regard as at rest to the vicinity of other bodies by a body as a part of matter i understand all that which is transferred together although it be perhaps composed of several parts which in themselves have other motions and i say that it is the transporting and not the force or action which transports with the view of showing that motion is always in the immovable thing not in that which moves for it seems to me that we are not accustomed to distinguish these two things with sufficient accuracy further i understand that it is a mode of the movable thing and not a substance just as figure is a property of the thing figured and repose of that which is at rest End of section seven. Section 8 of Selections from the Principles of Philosophy by René Descartes, translated by John Veitch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Part 3 of The Visible World 1. That we cannot think too highly of the works of God. Having now ascertained certain principles of material things, which were sought not by the prejudices of the senses, but by the light of reason, and which thus possess so great evidence that we cannot doubt of their truth, it remains for us to consider whether from these alone we can deduce the explication of all the phenomena of nature. We will commence with those phenomena that are of the greatest generality, and upon which the others depend, as, for example, with the general structure of this whole visible world but in order to our philosophizing aright regarding this two things are first of all to be observed the first is that we should ever bear in mind the infinity of the power and goodness of god that we may not fear falling into error by imagining his works to be too great beautiful and perfect but that we may on the contrary take care lest by supposing limits to them of which we have no certain knowledge we appear to think less highly than we ought of the power of god Two that we ought to beware lest in our presumption we imagine that the ends which god proposed to him in the creation of the world are understood by us the second is that we should beware of presuming too highly of ourselves as it seems we should do if we supposed certain limits to the world without being assured of their existence either by natural reasons or by divine revelation as if the power of our thought extended beyond what god has in reality made but likewise still more if we persuaded ourselves that all things were created by god for us only or if we merely supposed that we could comprehend by the power of our intellect the ends which god proposed to himself in creating the universe three in what sense it may be said that all things were created for the sake of man for although as far as regards morals it may be a pious thought to believe that god made all things for us seeing we may thus be incited to greater gratitude and love toward him and although it is even in some sense true because there is no created thing of which we cannot make some use if it be only that of exercising our mind in considering it and honouring god on account of it it is yet by no means probable 
that all things were created for us in this way that god had no other end in their creation and this supposition would be plainly ridiculous and inept in physical reasoning for we do not doubt but that many things exist or formerly existed and have now ceased to be which were never seen or known by man and were never of use to him End of section eight. Section nine of Selections from the Principles of Philosophy by Rene Descartes, translated by John Veitch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Part four of the Earth. One hundred and eighty-eight. Of what is to be borrowed from disquisitions on animals and man to advance the knowledge of material objects i should add nothing farther to this the fourth part of the principles of philosophy did i purpose carrying out my original design of writing a fifth and sixth part the one treating of things possessed of life that is animals and plants and the other of man but because i have not yet acquired sufficient knowledge of all the matters of which i should desire to treat in these two last parts and do not know whether i shall ever have sufficient leisure to finish them i will here subjoin a few things regarding the objects of our senses that i may not for the sake of the latter delay too long the publication of the former parts or of what may be desiderated in them which i might have reserved for explanations in those others for i have hitherto described this earth and generally the whole visible world as if it were merely a machine in which there was nothing at all to consider except the figures and motions of its parts whereas our senses present to us many other things for example colours smells sounds and the like of which if i did not speak at all it would be thought i had omitted the explication of the majority of the objects that are in nature one hundred and eighty nine what perception senses is and how we perceive we must know therefore that although the human soul is united to the whole body it has nevertheless its principal seat in the brain where alone it not only understands and imagines but also perceives and this by the medium of the nerves which are extended like threads from the brain to all the other members with which they are so connected that we can hardly touch any one of them without moving the extremities of some of the nerves spread over it and this motion passes to the other extremities of those nerves which are collected in the brain round the seat of the soul as i have already explained with sufficient minuteness in the fourth chapter of the dioptrics but the movements which are thus excited in the brain by the nerves variously affect the soul or mind which is intimately conjoined with the brain according to the diversity of the motions themselves and the diverse affections of the mind or thoughts that immediately rise from these motions are called perceptions of the senses sensuum perceptiones or as we commonly speak sensations senses one hundred and ninety of the distinction of the senses and first of the internal that is of the affections of the mind passions and the natural appetites the varieties of these sensations depend firstly on the diversity of the nerves themselves and secondly of the movements that are made in each nerve we have not however as many different senses as there are nerves we can distinguish but seven principal classes of nerves of which two belong to the internal and the other five to the external senses the nerves which extend to the stomach the esophagus the fauces and the other internal parts that are subservient to our natural wants constitute one of our internal senses this is called the natural appetite appetitus naturalis the other internal sense which embraces all the emotions commotiones of the mind or passions and affections as joy sadness love hate and the like depends upon the nerves which extend to the heart and the parts about the heart and are exceedingly small for by want of example when the blood happens to be pure and well tempered so that it dilates in the heart more readily and strongly than usual it is so enlarged and moves the small nerves scattered around the orifices that there is thence a corresponding movement in the brain which affects the mind with a certain natural feeling of joy and as often as these same nerves are moved in the same way although this is by other causes they excite in our mind the same feeling senses sentiment thus the imagination of the enjoyment of a good does not contain in itself the feeling of joy but it causes the animal spirits to pass from the brain to the muscles in which these nerves are inserted and thus dilating the orifices of the heart it also causes these small nerves to move in the way appointed by nature to afford the sensation of joy thus when we receive news the mind first of all judges of it and if the news be good it rejoices with that intellectual joy gaudium intellectuale which is independent of any emotion commotio 
of the body and which the stoics did not deny to their wise man although they supposed him exempt from all passion but as soon as this joy passes from the understanding to the imagination the spirits flow from the brain to the muscles that are about the heart and there excite the motion of the small nerves by means of which another motion is caused in the brain which affect the mind with the sensation of animal joy laetitia animalis on the same principle when the blood is so thick that it flows but sparingly into the ventricles of the heart and is not there sufficiently dilated it excites in the same nerves a motion quite different from the preceding which communicated to the brain gives to the mind the sensation of sadness although the mind itself is perhaps ignorant of the cause of its sadness and all the other causes which move these nerves in the same way may also give to the mind the same sensation but the other movements of the same nerves produce other effects as the feelings of love hate fear anger etc as far as they are merely affections or passions of the mind in other words as far as they are confused thoughts which the mind has not from itself alone but from its being closely joined to the body from which it receives impressions for there is the widest difference between these passions and the distinct thoughts which we have of what ought to be loved or chosen or shunned etc although these are often enough found together the natural appetites as hunger thirst and the others are likewise sensations excited in the mind by means of the nerves of the stomach falsies and other parts and are entirely different from the will which we have to eat drink and to do all that which we think proper for the conservation of our body but because this will or appetition almost always accompanies them they are therefore named appetites one hundred and ninety one of the external senses and first of touch we commonly reckon the external senses five in number because there are as many different kinds of objects which move the nerves and their organs and an equal number of kinds of confused thoughts excited in the soul by these emotions in the first place the nerves terminating in the skin of the whole body can be touched through this medium by any terrene objects whatever and moved by these holes in one way by their hardness in another by their gravity in a third by their heat in a fourth by their humidity etc and in as many diverse modes as they are either moved or hindered from their ordinary motion to that extent are diverse sensations excited in the mind from which a corresponding number of tactile qualities derive their appellations besides this when these nerves are moved a little more powerfully than usual but not nevertheless to the degree by which your body is in any way hurt there thus arises a sensation of titillation which is naturally agreeable to the mind because it testifies to it of the powers of the body with which it is joined in that the latter can suffer the action causing this titillation without being hurt but if this action be strong enough to hurt our body in any way this gives to our mind the sensation of pain and we thus see why corporeal pleasure and pain although sensations of quite an opposite character arise nevertheless from causes nearly alike one hundred and ninety two of taste in the second place the outer nerves scattered over the tongue and the parts in its vicinity are diversely moved by the particles of the same bodies separated from each other and floating in the saliva in the mouth and thus cause sensations of diverse tastes according to the diversity of figure in these particles one hundred and ninety three of smell thirdly two nerves also or appendages of the brain for they do not go beyond the limits of the skull are moved by the particles of terrestrial bodies separated and flying in the air not indeed by all particles indifferently but by those only that are sufficiently subtle and penetrating to enter the pores of the bone we call the spongy when drawn into the nostrils and thus to reach the nerves from the different motions of these particles arise the sensations of the different smells one hundred and ninety four of hearing fourthly there are two nerves within the ears so attached to three small bones that are mutually sustaining and the first of which rests on the small membrane that covers the cavity we call the tympanum of the ear that all the diverse vibrations which the surrounding air communicates to this membrane are transmitted to the mind by these nerves and these vibrations give rise according to their diversity to the sensations of the different sounds one hundred and ninety five of sight finally the extremities of the optic nerves composing the coat in the eyes called the retina are not moved by the air nor by any terrestrial object but only by the globules of the second element whence we have the sense of light and colours as i have already at sufficient length explained in the dioptrics and the treatise of meteors one hundred and ninety six that the soul perceives only in so far as it is in the brain 
it is clearly established however that the soul does not perceive in so far as it is in each member of the body but only in so far as it is in the brain where the nerves by their movements convey to it the diverse actions of the external objects that touch the parts of the body in which they are inserted for in the first place there are various maladies which though they affect the brain alone yet bring disorder upon or deprive us altogether of the use of our senses just as sleep which affects the brain only and yet takes from us daily during a great part of our time the faculty of perception which afterwards in our waking state is restored to us the second proof is that though there be no disease in the brain or in the members in which the organs of the external senses are it is nevertheless sufficient to take away sensation from the part of the body where the nerves terminate if only the movement of one of the nerves that extend from the brain to these members be obstructed in any part of the distance that is between the two and the last proof is that we sometimes feel pain as if in certain of our members the cause of which however is not in these members where it is felt but somewhere nearer the brain through which the nerves pass that give to the mind the sensation of it i could establish this fact by innumerable experiments i will here however merely refer to one of them a girl suffering from a bad ulcer in the hand had her eyes bandaged whenever the surgeon came to visit her not being able to bear the sight of the dressing of the sore and the gangrene having spread after the expiry of a few days the arm was amputated from the elbow without the girl's knowledge linen cloths tied one above the other were substituted in place of the part amputated so that she remained for some time without knowing that the operation had been performed and meanwhile she complained of feeling various pains sometimes in one finger of the hand that was cut off and sometimes in another the only explanation of this is that the nerves which before stretched downwards from the brain to the hand and then terminated in the arm close to the elbow were there moved in the same way as they required to be moved before in the hand for the purpose of impressing on the mind residing in the brain the sensation of pain in this or that finger and this clearly shows that the pain of the hand is not felt by the mind in so far as it is in the hand but in so far as it is in the brain one hundred and ninety seven that the nature of the mind is such that from the motion alone of body the various sensations can be excited in it in the next place it can be proved that our mind is of such a nature that the motions of the body alone are sufficient to excite in it all sorts of thoughts without it being necessary that these should in any way resemble the motions which give rise to them and especially that these motions can excite in it those confused thoughts called sensations sensus sensationis for we see that words whether uttered by the voice or merely written excite in our minds all kinds of thoughts and emotions on the same paper with the same pen and ink by merely moving the point of the pen over the paper in a particular way we can trace letters that will raise in the minds of our readers the thoughts of combats tempests or the furies and the passions of indignation and sorrow in place of which if the pen be moved in another way hardly different from the former the slight change will cause thoughts widely different from the above such as those of repose peace pleasantness and the quite opposite passions of love and joy some one will perhaps object that writing and speech do not immediately excite in the mind any passions or imaginations of things different from the letters and sounds but afford simply the knowledge of these on occasion of which the mind understanding the signification of the words afterwards excites in itself the imaginations and passions that correspond to the words but what will be said of the sensations of pain and titillation the motion merely of a sword cutting a part of our skin causes pain but does not on that account make us aware of the motion or figure of the sword and it is certain that this sensation of pain is not less different from the motion that causes it or from that of the part of our body which the sword cuts than are the sensations we have of colour sound odour or taste on this ground we may conclude that our mind is of such a nature that the motions alone of certain bodies can also easily excite in it all the other sensations as the motion of a sword excites in it the sensation of pain End of section nine. Section 10 of Selections from the Principles of Philosophy by René Descartes, translated by John Veitch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Of the Earth. 198. That by our senses we know nothing of external objects beyond their figure or situation, magnitude, and motion. Besides, we observe no such difference between the nerves as to lead us to judge that one set of them convey to the brain from the organs of the external senses anything different from another, or that anything at all reaches the brain besides the local motion of the nerves themselves. 
and we see that local motion alone causes in us not only the sensation of titillation and of pain but also of light and sounds for if we receive a blow on the eye of sufficient force to cause the vibration of the stroke to reach the retina we see numerous sparks of fire which nevertheless are not out of our eye and when we stop our ear with our finger we hear a humming sound the cause of which can only proceed from the agitation of the air that is shut up within it finally we frequently observe that heat hardness weight and the other sensible qualities as far as they are in objects and also the form of those bodies that are purely material as for example the forms of fire are produced in them by the motion of certain other bodies and that these in their turn likewise produce other motions in other bodies and we can easily conceive how the motion of one body may be caused by that of another and diversified by the size figure and situation of its parts but we are wholly unable to conceive how these same things that is size figure and motion can produce something else of a nature entirely different from themselves as for example those substantial forms and real qualities which many philosophers suppose to be in our bodies nor likewise can we conceive how these qualities or forms possess force to cause motions in other bodies but since we know from the nature of our soul that the diverse motions of body are sufficient to produce in it all the sensations which it has and since we learn from experience that several of its sensations are in reality caused by such motions while we do not discover that anything besides these motions ever passes from the organs of the external senses to the brain we have reason to conclude that we in no way likewise apprehend that in external objects which we call light colour smell taste sound heat or cold and the other tactile qualities or that which we call their substantial forms unless as the various dispositions of these objects which have the power of moving our nerves in various ways one hundred and ninety nine that there is no phenomenon of nature whose explanation has been omitted in this treatise and thus it may be gathered from an enumeration that is easily made that there is no phenomenon of nature whose explanation has been omitted in this treatise for beyond what is perceived by the senses there is nothing that can be considered a phenomenon of nature but leaving out of account motion magnitude figure and the situation of the parts of each body which i have explained as they exist in body we perceive nothing out of us by our senses except light colours smells tastes sounds and the tactile qualities and these i have recently shown to be nothing more at least so far as they are known to us than certain dispositions of the objects consisting in magnitude figure and motion two hundred that this treatise contains no principles which are not universally received and that this philosophy is not new but of all others the most ancient and common but i am desirous also that it should be observed that though i have here endeavoured to give an explanation of the whole nature of material things i have nevertheless made use of no principle which was not received and approved by aristotle and by the other philosophers of all ages so that this philosophy so far from being new is of all the others the most ancient and common for i have in truth merely considered the figure motion and magnitude of bodies and examined what must follow from their mutual concourse on the principles of mechanics which are confirmed by certain and daily experience but no one ever doubted that bodies are moved and that they are of various sizes and figures according to the diversity of which their motions also vary and that from mutual collision those somewhat greater than others are divided into many smaller and thus change figure we have experience of the truth of this not merely by a single sense but by several as touch sight and hearing we also distinctly imagine and understand it this cannot be said of any of the other things that fall under our senses as colours sounds and the like for each of these affects but one of our senses and merely impresses upon our imagination a confused image of itself affording our understanding no distinct knowledge of what it is two hundred and one that sensible bodies are composed of insensible particles but i allow many particles in each body that are perceived by none of our senses and this will not perhaps be approved of by those who take the senses for the measure of the knowable we greatly wrong human reason however as appears to me if we suppose that it does not go beyond the eyesight for no one can doubt that there are bodies so small as not to be perceptible by any of our senses provided he only consider what is each moment added to those bodies that are being increased little by little and what is taken from those that are diminished in the same way a tree increases daily and it is impossible to conceive how it becomes greater than it was before unless we at the same time conceive that some body is added to it 
but who ever observed by the senses those small bodies that are in one day added to a tree while growing among the philosophers at least those who hold that quantity is indefinitely divisible ought to admit that in the division the parts may become so small as to be wholly imperceptible and indeed it ought not to be a matter of surprise that we are unable to perceive very minute bodies for the nerves that must be moved by objects to cause perception are not themselves very minute but are like small cords being composed of a quantity of smaller fibres and thus the most minute bodies are not capable of moving them nor do i think that any one who makes use of his reason will deny that we philosophize with much greater truth when we judge of what takes place in those small bodies which are imperceptible from their minuteness only after the analogy of what we see occurring in those we do perceive and in this way explain all that is in nature as i have essayed to do in this treatise than when we give an explanation of the same things by inventing i know not what novelties that have no relation to the things we actually perceive as first matter substantial forms and all that grand array of qualities which many are in the habit of supposing each of which is more difficult to comprehend than all that is professed to be explained by means of them two hundred and two that the philosophy of democritus is not less different from ours than from the common but it may be said that democritus also supposed certain corpuscles that were of various figures sizes and motions from the heaping together and mutual concourse of which all sensible bodies arose and nevertheless his mode of philosophizing is commonly rejected by all to this i replied that the philosophy of democritus was never rejected by any one because he allowed the existence of bodies smaller than those we perceive and attributed to them diverse sizes figures and motions for no one can doubt that there are in reality such as we have already shown but it was rejected in the first place because he supposed that these corpuscles were indivisible on which ground i also rejected in the second place because he imagined there was a vacuum about them which i showed to be impossible thirdly because he attributed gravity to these bodies of which i deny the existence in any body in so far as a body is considered by itself because it is a quality that depends on the relations of situation and motion which several bodies bear to each other and finally because he has not explained in particular how all things arose from the concourse of corpuscles alone or if he gave this explanation with regard to a few of them his whole reasoning was far from being coherent or such as would warrant us in extending the same explanation to the whole of nature this at least is the verdict we must give regarding his philosophy if we may judge of his opinions from what has been handed down to us in writing i leave it to others to determine whether the philosophy i profess possesses a valid coherency and whether on its principles we can make the requisite number of deductions and inasmuch as the consideration of figure magnitude and motion has been admitted by aristotle and by all the others as well as by democritus and since i reject all that the latter has supposed with this single exception while i reject generally all that has been supposed by the others it is plain that this mode of philosophizing has no more affinity with that of democritus than of any other particular sect two hundred and three how we may arrive at the knowledge of the figures magnitudes and motions of the insensible particles of bodies but since i assign determinate figures magnitude and motions to the insensible particles of bodies as if i had seen them whereas i admit that they do not fall under the senses some one will perhaps demand how i have come by my knowledge of them to this i reply that i first considered in general all the clear and distinct notions of material things that are to be found in our understanding and that finding no others except those of figures magnitudes and motions and of the rules according to which these three things can be diversified by each other which rules are the principles of geometry and mechanics i judge that all the knowledge man can have of nature must of necessity be drawn from this source because all the other notions we have of sensible things as confused and obscure can be of no avail in affording us the knowledge of anything out of ourselves but must serve rather to impede it thereupon taking as my ground of inference the simplest and best known of the principles that have been implanted in our minds by nature i consider the chief differences that could possibly subsist between the magnitudes and figures and situations of bodies insensible on account of their smallness alone and what sensible effects could be produced by their various modes of coming into contact and afterwards when i found like effects in the bodies that we perceive by our senses i judged that they could have been thus produced especially since no other mode of explaining them could be devised and in this matter the example of several bodies made by art was of great service to me 
for i recognize no difference between these and natural bodies beyond this that the effects of machines depend for the most part on the agency of certain instruments which as they must bear some proportion to the hands of those who make them are always so large that their figures and motion can be seen in place of which the effects of natural bodies almost always depend upon certain organs so minute as to escape our senses and it is certain that all the rules of mechanics belong also to physics of which it is a part or species so that all the artificial is withal natural for it is not less natural for a clock made of the requisite number of wheels to mark the hours than for a tree which has sprung from this or that seed to produce the fruit peculiar to it accordingly just as those who are familiar with automata when they are informed of the use of a machine and see some of its parts easily infer from these the way in which the others that are not seen by them are made so from considering the sensible effects and parts of natural bodies i have essayed to determine the character of their causes and insensible parts two hundred and four that touching the things which our senses do not perceive it is sufficient to explain how they can be and that this is all that aristotle has essayed but here some one will perhaps reply that although i have supposed causes which could produce all natural objects we ought not on this account to conclude that they were produced by these causes for just as the same artisan can make two clocks which though they both equally well indicate the time and are not different in outward appearance have nevertheless nothing resembling in the composition of their wheels so doubtless the supreme maker of things has an infinity of diverse means at his disposal by each of which he could have made all the things of this world to appear as we see them without it being possible for the human mind to know which of all these means he chose to employ i most freely concede this and i believe that i have done all that was required if the causes i have assigned are such that their effects accurately correspond to all the phenomena of nature without determining whether it is by these or by others that they are actually produced and it will be sufficient for the use of life to know the causes thus imagined for medicine mechanics and in general all the arts to which the knowledge of physics is of service have for their end only those effects that are sensible and that are accordingly to be reckoned among the phenomena of nature and lest it should be supposed that aristotle did or professed to do anything more than this it ought to be remembered that he himself expressly says at the commencement of the seventh chapter of the first book of the meteorologies that with regard to things which are not manifest to the senses he thinks to adduce sufficient reasons and demonstrations of them if he only shows that they may be such as he explains them two hundred and five that nevertheless there is a moral certainty that all the things of this world are such as has here been shown they may be but nevertheless that i may not wrong the truth by supposing it less certain than it is i will here distinguish two kinds of certitude the first is called moral that is a certainty sufficient for the conduct of life though if we look to the absolute power of god what is morally certain may be false thus those who never visited rome do not doubt that it is a city of italy though it might be that all from whom they got their information were deceived again if any one wishing to decipher a letter written in latin characters that are not placed in regular order bethinks himself of reading a b wherever an a is found and a c wherever there is a b and thus of substituting in place of each letter the one which follows it in the order of the alphabet and if by this means he finds that there are certain latin words composed of these he will not doubt that the true meaning of the writing is contained in these words although he may discover this only by conjecture and although it is possible that the writer of it did not arrange the letters on this principle of alphabetical order but on some other and thus concealed another meaning in it for this is so improbable especially when a cipher contains a number of words as to seem incredible but they who observe how many things regarding the magnet fire and the fabric of the whole world are here deduced from a very small number of principles though they deemed that i had taken them up at random and without grounds will yet perhaps acknowledge that it could hardly happen that so many things should go here if these principles were false two hundred and six that we possess even more than a moral certainty of it besides there are some even among natural things which we judge to be absolutely certain absolute certainty arises when we judge that it is impossible a thing can be otherwise than as we think it this certainty is founded on the metaphysical ground that as god is supremely good and the source of all truth the faculty of distinguishing truth from error which he gave us cannot be fallacious so long as we use it aright and distinctly perceive anything by it of this character are the demonstrations of mathematics the knowledge that material things exist 
and the clear reasonings that are formed regarding them the results i have given in this treatise will perhaps be admitted to a place in the class of truths that are absolutely certain if it be considered that they are deduced in a continuous series from the first and most elementary principles of human knowledge especially if it be sufficiently understood that we can perceive no external objects unless some local motion be caused by them in our nerves and that such motion cannot be caused by the fixed stars owing to their great distance from us unless a motion be also produced in them and in the whole heavens lying between them and us for these points being admitted all the others at least the more general doctrines which i have advanced regarding the world or earth for example the fluidity of the heavens part three section forty six will appear to be almost the only possible explanations of the phenomena they present two hundred and seven that however i submit all my opinions to the authority of the church nevertheless lest i should presume too far i affirm nothing but submit all these my opinions to the authority of the church and the judgment of the more sage and i desire no one to believe anything i may have said unless he is constrained to admit it by the force and evidence of reason end of section ten recording by phone end of selections from the principles of philosophy by rene descartes translated by john veitch